Welcome to Bear Bets. I'm your host, Bear Chris Felica, along with uh, co-host Jeff Schwartz. And uh, we're going to get right into it today. We, we had a bunch to talk about with the uh, Sweet 16 and the NCAA tournament uh, coming up on Thursday. So we got our uh, our man, John Fanta, here to talk about the uh, the tournament, what we've kind of seen so far, where we're going from here. And, and, and John, it's something, one of the big themes, obviously, of the week has just been how how chalky it's been. You've got every one and two seed in the Sweet 16. you got the one double-digit seed, NC State, with ACC champion, 11 seed. And, and looking back in retrospect now, is this something that we maybe should have seen coming, being that we had so many upsets in the conference tournaments where you had lower seeds when those mid majors and low conference you weren't really going to get a ton of upsets should we should we not really be that surprised by this well bear i i'm in agreement with that i i don't think we should be that surprised by it and I, and i think when the field came out i felt really weird filling out my bracket because i didn't have a team at the six line seven line or eight line in my elite eight and it's been 13 straight years that a team beyond the four line, meaning five, six, seven, eight, and so on, has made the final four, 13 consecutive seasons. And it's trending that we're not going to see that this year. And we've only ever seen four ones make a final four one time in 2008, the Mario Chalmers, Kansas here. But when the field came out, like it wasn't just the bid stealers. You know, you see Duquesne on an 11 line and, and you just sit there and you say, I just don't see it. If, eventually the gas is going to run out of the tank. Um, and then you look at, at even the middle at largest and they're just, there weren't a lot of convincing cases. I mean, Michigan state was the definition of inconsistent throughout the season. They, they, they had their ups, they had their downs. Um, you know, they had a great win in the first round, but they weren't able to keep that up. And I think that we saw that throughout much of the middle of this field. So with that in mind, like all season long, you know, you cover this sport and what, what makes the madness crazy is. Sometimes you get to the madness and everything that you've covered is out the window, but the top three in this sport have been so overwhelmingly good that some of the teams that are not in the top three had lost to them so badly, but that almost skews your thinking on some of them because they're not that bad. Marquette's not that bad. They just, they just got blown out and humiliated by Connecticut because Connecticut's <laughs> the best team in this sport. So it's a little bit two sided guys, but I'm not that surprised. And I do think it's refreshing for the sport a year after a random final four and some smaller brands, we are going to get a final four in Arizona that is really fitting. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Watch where you're throwing smaller brand around with my Miami Hurricanes. We are a basketball <laughs> school now. I believe we were uh, ninth out of 14th, or maybe even worse than or worse than that, actually, uh, in, in the ATC. But Bethay is coming in next year. We're, gonna, we're, we're, we're back to being a blue guy. You got unlimited NIL. Uh, 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 John, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, the Blue Bloods being in this spot. I, I do feel like it's better for the sport to see these big names in the Sweet 16, in the Elite Eight, and moving forward. I know people love upsets, and we love to talk about the Oaklands and whatnot, but do you think it's better for the sport to see all these Blue Bloods past the first weekend? Yeah, it is. It's better for college basketball. It, it really is. Um, for the men's side, you know, I, w I will say this to you guys. I believe that women's basketball has done an all-around better job of promoting its superstars. Now, it helps when you have the all-around best player uh, that we've perhaps ever seen and certainly the best scorer in Caitlin Clark. But on the men's side, this is huge. You know, it's huge because in men's college basketball the last couple of years, some of the biggest faces in the sports history have, have exited the sport, and those are coaches. So right now we're seeing a bit of a, a renaissance in the sport of some of these big time brands, but more than anything, like, here's the deal. You have the reigning national champions in UConn who are trying to capture history and become the first in Florida to go back to back. You have the best player in the country in Zach Eady. And if Eady didn't make it to this point, guys, I think it would have really, really damaged things because we've talked all year about redemption and it looks like that redemption is, is happening. You know, Houston, Kelvin Sampson has won as much as anybody over the last five years. They might not be a blue blood, uh, but but they they play like one. They've won like one over the last half decade or so. But then you go right down the line. You've got Carolina. You've got Duke. I think Arizona is super intriguing in this tournament. Heck, even Tennessee with Dalton Connect 
is a great story. I mean, the Volunteers brought in Dalton Connect from Northern Colorado. This is a guy who was not getting watched by many eyeballs at all to he's the second best player in all of college basketball. So we have a, a Sweet 16 that is rich with storylines. Even Gonzaga, who went from bubbly to five, from five weeks ago to now being a team that's dangerous and playing their best basketball. Recognizable names, Mark Few, Matt Painter, Dan Hurley now. Hurley's become maybe the face of this sport from the coaching side. And, hey, we've got John Shire who's trying to prove himself. Hubert Davis trying to get to a second Final Four in three years. I'm intrigued. I think it's great for college basketball. It means more people, more casuals are going to watch the sport this weekend because they recognize the team on their screens. That's not a bad thing. So, so we, we, we talk all about it. You just ran, ran through it and put it in. In, in, in great fashion there, just all the, the storylines that you have like within each of these individual teams or so. So like of these one, like, like we all, I think we, we haven't had one versus two and never in every elite eight game. They had like one versus two, three, three, one versus two is a one versus three. I think the year Oregon was a three and lost to Kansas. I think in, in that, two, in that 2008 season, I think it was, but um, you, you look at, of these one one and two seeds, which do you think is potentially in the most trouble this weekend uh, in, in the Sweet 16? Mm, I would say Marquette. You know, I, I I get a little bit wary of their matchup with NC State. I know I know that Marquette's a heavy favorite in that one. Um, I I don't I think NC State is riding the heater in this and it's going to be able to score against Marquette. So I'm not sure about, about that line. In terms of the ones, UConn, to me, is unstoppable. They're a freight train. They're going to get to Arizona, right? Um, you know, I, I, I like the other ones. That, like Carolina, could they have some vulnerability because Alabama scores the ball so well? Maybe, but I don't see it. If there's a vulnerable one, it's Houston because Duke has found something here. Their backcourt was exceptional this past weekend in Brooklyn. Jared McCain had 30 points. That's too shy of a Duke freshman scoring record in the NCAA tournament to only Zion Williamson. And when people are like, well, they beat James Madison in Vermont. You do not apologize for NCAA tournament wins. <laughs> I've, I've never heard. I've never heard of such a thing. The fact is you're there. Brett, Brett Underwood says it best. The Illinois head coach. He's like the key to making an NCAA tournament run is to keep making the NCAA tournament. And eventually when you roll the dice on the craps table, it's going to come out okay for you. So for me, guys, like I, I, I look at it from the standpoint of Houston requires Jamal Shedd, LJ Cryer, and Emmanuel Sharp to be great. They're not a deep team. And I worry about if one of those guys has an off game, the way McCain's shooting it, the way Tyrese Proctor can play. And Duke should have the best front court player in this game in Kyle Filipowski. I think John Shire's team has, has found something here late. It's very late. But I think they found something here. And I think if there's a one seed that could go down, no, it's not Purdue this time. No, it's not UConn. No, it's not North Carolina. I do think Houston is susceptible in this Sweet 16 game. Taking Purdue out of this answer, which is the team that gives UConn the most trouble between now and a championship game? Great question. Um or is it Purdue? You can say Purdue, I guess, if you don't have no, an answer. No, <laughs> no. From now to a championship game, it's Arizona. Yeah. Why? Why? Because if they play Arizona in the Final Four, it will be an Arizona home game. Yeah. You know, that's a big element to this Final Four, potentially, is that it is in Glendale. It's been a while since we've seen basically a home game for a team in the Final Four. I don't recall a time that that happened. Like, that. that I, I really don't. And I think for Arizona... They're so momentum-based. They're so pace-based. They could score, and they defend. If you look at the metrics, Arizona fits every metric for a national champion in the last 25 years between offense and defense. Two teams are in Ken Palm top 10 offensive and defensive adjusted efficiency, UConn and Arizona. So if the Wildcats can advance to a Final Four, that Final Four game between UConn and Arizona would be a treat for all of us, would have an Arizona crowd, would have Caleb Love and if it, Kylan Boswell's the key to this whole equation for Tommy Lloyd. He really is. He's got to be good for them to beat a UConn, for them to beat a heavyweight. But I think that the Wildcats could give UConn trouble. I'd say Carolina, but when the two teams met back in December, Carolina did not have enough, and Armando Baycott was not effective against Donovan Klingon and company inside. 
Yeah, it, I wonder if the, the the way Clemson defended the ball and eliminated Baylor's transition and Baylor's offense, like if if Brad Brunell's team can can duplicate that effort. That could be an interesting game, I think, this week. It's just a, while all everything you said about the metrics and the player is just a, still a small part of me that doesn't trust Arizona when push I, comes to shove. I don't disagree with you at all. There's a trust issue. There's a couple of programs here that are big, big brands, but have been hard to trust in the tournament in the past. Arizona is one of them. And Bear, where you're right is, Clemson's got experience. They've got experience and balance. They know how to slow the game down. Chase Hunter has back-to-back 20-plus point games. P.J. Hall's a seasoned vet. Joe Girard's a shot maker. Clemson can slow the game down to their liking if they do that. Mick Cronin said this on the herd earlier this week. The way to beat Arizona is to stick them in the half court. That's what Clemson can do. In, in, one, in the other game, in another team, which – we certainly have had trust issues with <clears throat> the coach and the team is Tennessee. And do you think winning a game like that in the, against Texas, uh, it was an ugly game, but with a two or 25 or something like that from three point range, they were up. Then, then the next thing, you know, Texas has got a shot to, to tie it or, or win it. Do you think maybe winning being on the losing side of so many of those games, you think maybe winning a game like that might cause Rick Barnes to kind of approach his team and like exhale and be like, see, you can win these games. You can gut it out. You can win another. Maybe they finally play loose and free against the free. Like this should be a really intriguing, like neither team shot the ball well in, in, in their second round game, Creighton or Tennessee and Creighton probably shouldn't even be here right now. But uh, th- th- this could be a game where I think we see a lot of threes rain back and forth. I see short stake in his head. Well, the, the you know, yeah, Crane shouldn't be there. If we can make a foul shot, Oregon's playing this game. Oh, it's upsetting. Shoot, make your foul shots, everyone. Well, you should know who to in the, inbound the ball to. The problem, okay, I don't want to get into Oregon podcast here. <laughs> there was no one left to play. We had five, no, no one was healthy. And, and we, had, we had a freshman you know, taking the ball out. Oh, it doesn't matter. The Oregon's not in the tournament. Talk about someone else. No, you know what? I agree with you, Bear. And if you're, if you're Creighton, you're like, we got an extra life. To me, Tennessee should have beat Texas by 15. Mm-hmm. They had a horrible shooting performance. They were the far better team, though. But that's the difference with this Tennessee team is when they are stuck, they still have the second best player in America in Dalton Connect, in my humble opinion. And he unleashes something from Tennessee that makes you trust them more. You know, it's it's like the girl that you've been trying to date for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden you just feel like maybe she figured some things out, but she also <laughs> believes in you because you got a job and now you two can be a couple. <laughs> I mean, Tennessee in the past, I haven't, I haven't been willing to date them, but now I am a little bit willing to date them. Um, you know, I think that, that they are a team that with Santiago Vescovi and with Sakai Ziegler and with Aju on the interior, they're still tough as nails. Now they have someone who gives them a little bit of finesse. You know, it, it's still the same grind you down type of bar that's dirty and 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 requires, you know, it's 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 not looking for any requirements for you to walk in. They've got a 299 beer for you waiting at the bar. But now if you want a cocktail, Dalton Connect can give you a little bit of flair to what they do, and they're capable of winning if it's a finesse type of game. They can win a higher scoring game because they have someone who opens up what they do offensively. I expect Tennessee to shoot the ball better. I would think Creighton does too, but Tennessee's defense could be very disruptive to Creighton. One thing about Creighton, they don't play a fast tempo. It's one of the misconceptions with this Creighton team. Everyone's like, Creighton loves to run. They'd like to when they can get out, but Tennessee's going to try to lock them down in the half court. And the other thing Creighton doesn't do is foul. So uh, that, they that'll be foul. See. They, they, they don't They don't give... The, the, the opponent cheapies and, the, and we'll see if that continues this week. John, you're the best man. Enjoy Thank the you. games up in, uh, in, in Boston this week. And uh, hopefully we'll talk against it. I love the show. I'm the biggest bear and Jeff Schwartz fan out there. Love you guys. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.
Thank you to John Fander for joining us. That was great to hear his perspective as we get to the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight. Now it's gambling group chat time. It's me, it's Bear, it's Will Hill, it's Sammy P. We talk about all the games and all the futures heading into the big weekend of March Madness. Here it is. So now we are indeed joined by Sammy P and Will Hill for the gambling group chat. We're going to kick around all eight of the Sweet 16 games to be played on Thursday and Friday. So we may as well start it off with the defending national champion and a rematch of uh, last year's national championship game where UConn won relatively easily over uh, the Aztecs. And number seems to suggest that that will be the case again this year. UConn now, as we are recording, this is up to 11 and a total of 136. The I don't know about any any of you guys, but I'm not interested in stepping in front of the UConn freight train right now. I know uh, the double-digit favorites have not necessarily done great uh, in the Sweet 16 in recent years, but th this just doesn't look like a, a situation. Where you, what is different about, like, UConn is better than they were last year. San Diego State is not as good as they were last year. Why should we expect anything different, uh, Will? Nope, I'm with you. And it was, I'm just looking at the final score last year, 76-59, which it didn't feel like that much of a blowout. It just felt like, you know, UConn was in control throughout. It was it, They were comfortably ahead, but it wasn't like a blowout. But that's just what UConn does, where you feel like you're with them. You feel like, hey, we're within striking distance. And then they have one of these runs, these avalanche of a runs where it's 13 to two and it's good night, see you later. And I just, uh, I expect the same thing. I think Dutcher's a good coach. He'll have a good game plan. Uh, I think San Diego State will try to slow the game down. So, hey, if you don't want to lay the 11, maybe you just play the under 135 and a half. Maybe you play the under San Diego State team total. Uh, but look, I, like I said, Dutch will have a good game plan. It's just, will it matter? Does it matter? Is there anything you could throw with this team uh, that's going to disrupt their dominance? And I, I guess if you are if you have one concern about UConn, it's just kind of the law of averages where, hey, they, six games last year in the tournament where they just destroy everyone. Now we're two games into this year where they've just buried everyone. That's eight in a row. It's just the nature of the tournament. Hey, they're going to have a night where they shoot four of 23 from three at some point. Can they overcome that? I guess that's what you're worried about. But uh, anything other than that, it's just it's hard to see past UConn at this point, Sammy. I'm in such a weird spot with UConn because it, it's so easy the last eight tournament games to just say, hey, lay the points with UConn. And it's like, well, yeah, they're good, but they're not great. And yet they just they keep rolling teams. And it's it's such a weird team, Jeff, because Danny Hurley is such a psycho in the in the best of ways. He has this team believing they're the underdog. It's like you guys were four to one to win the tournament before it started. Right? Us against the world. What? You're you're the perennial favorite this year. Like it's ridiculous to me. And like the team has bought into the fact yeah. that it's us against the world. Yet they were literally four to one to win the title. It's, it's I, I, I think I, I think the committee helped with helped with that by. Give, giving them Iowa State, who a lot of people thought uh, could have been a one seed, by giving him Illinois, who is red hot and winning the, the Big Ten tournament, and, and, and Auburn, who wound up losing, but people thought were deserving of being a high. Like, I think I think Danny was able to kind of sell his team a, a bag of goods. Like, like, look, they don't want you to win. Look at what they're doing. They're making your road as difficult as they possibly can. So. It, we we saw with Michigan football as well with the with, with the Harbaugh the, the the spying cheating scandal and how they were able to turn that into a Michigan versus the world and go on to win a national title. So like, look, mo motivation is a power is probably the most disrespect and motivation like the most powerful factors I think when you're dealing with like 18, 19, 20 year old kids who uh, uh, sometimes need a little bit of a a push. And, and, and Sammy, you're right. I, I think they certainly got it here. I've said this for years. I think the superpower of elite teams and elite players is convincing themselves they're the underdog. It doesn't just happen with Michigan football. Georgia football, two years no. ago, someone after the game, they thought we were going seven and five. Like, no one said that. No, no one, one thought that. <laughs> what Tom Brady has done for years, and, and the Chiefs convinced themselves they were underdogs. It, it's what these great teams do. UConn's also playing in their region. They're very good against the spread in their region. Their coach is very good against the spread as well. Overall, in tournament games, I feel like everything's lining up for UConn to, to do the same thing they did last year to San Diego State. The only question I have, guys, I'll post to all three of you, is we saw all these favorites cover in the first weekend, these public favorites. Does it give you hesitation to go back to that well now? Because law averages would, would tell you this is the weekend where Clemson covers and San Diego State covers and NC State covers, like all these bigger dogs 
end up getting home in this in, in excuse me in these games. Well, also think about this too. This is a glorified home game for UConn. Yeah. I mean, it's in Boston, so it's going to be seventy percent <laughs> UConn people. So it's this is a a rare case where you have you know the team that everybody's going to bet is going to be at home. Basically, I mean, it's not too far from stores, the campus. So this game I put on a, on a separate island. I can't bet against UConn. I, I probably should. If I didn't take so many stupid dogs, Will, like Moorhead State and Akron <laughs> and Grand Canyon that were covering for 36 minutes and then fell apart late, maybe I'd be more apropos to get behind the dog. But I'm just I'm staying far away from this one, man. Yeah, even a team like Utah State, which you look at the final score and they lose by about 100 points. I mean, that was 24-20 Utah State early on. You say, all right, they're running some good offense. Maybe they're in it, and then the game is just over. Yeah, one more point on, on UConn San Diego State. There's a, a not just a home court advantage, but there's a little travel situational advantage where UConn hasn't been on a plane in a long time. They had the Big East tournament close to their building. Last week, they're in Brooklyn, so rest travel schedule all that's in their favor meanwhile san diego state was on the other side of the country midnight one o'clock in the morning on sunday and, and some of the, the scheduling of these times is not very friendly to the east coast viewer and just uh very hard to figure out but san diego state's playing until one o'clock in the morning sunday into monday now they have to go across the country play the early game on the other coast uh thursday the early game so you guys just sitting there they're in their own bed they're sleeping they're rested and they're just licking their chops waiting for you to come across the country so add that into uh, another reason in this bucket why it's hard to go against UConn here and most and most likely on Saturday we'll be seeing UConn awaiting the uh, the winner of the the second game Thursday night Illinois Iowa State the Cyclones minus one and a half uh 146 I do have a play in this game and I just played Iowa State on the money line at minus 120 um I think their defense could give uh Illinois some problems look I, I know Illinois has been awesome in the tournament uh grant it was Moorhead State it was Duquesne teams, not necessarily who are going to be able to slow the Illini down. And yes, at the same time, I know on the flip, Iowa State, look, you're not going to confuse San Diego State nor um, – who did they beat in the second round? It's, uh, I'm, I'm escaping Wazoo. my mind. Washington State. Wazoo, yeah, exactly. You're not going to confuse either of those teams for, for Illinois. But I'll look, going into this tournament, I was a little – worried that Iowa State might be a little bit too trendy of a team. Maybe they would be upset prone in the first two rounds, but they have been absolutely lights out uh, in the first two games. So I do like Iowa State here. Look, I paid a little bit of money line tax just to play the money line instead of lay the point and a half. So I do like the clones here. Uh, uh, Sammy, I know uh, Illinois is a team that you're pretty dialed into, uh, what, what do you got? What do you think about the Illinois' chances on Thursday? Illinois is going to go as far as their guards will take them. That's Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damask. And they're two big physical guards, too. And I think it's a great matchup, you know, to watch these two teams play. Unfortunately, it's going to be 10 o'clock on the East Coast, maybe even later when it tips. So Jeff will be asleep, uh, likely. 10 <laughs> 10, the tip time for Illinois and Iowa State. Who put I'll take the over, by the way, on that oh, tip yeah. time. I mean, good Lord. Uh, but if those guards are, are are taking care of the basketball and making shots, Illinois could beat anybody. Um, yeah, I really, I really believe that uh, their defensive length is a problem. Their pace is a problem. And this total, when we think about Illinois, Iowa State, you know, I, I would think this would be in the low 140s. But the fact that we're seeing 146, 146 and a half, Guys, that's more of an Illinois total because mm -hmm. Illinois wants to play with tempo and pace. So if it's Illinois track meet, that's going to be a problem for Iowa State. Iowa State has to slow Illinois down and turn this thing into a half court game because if they don't, they're not going to win. If I could only watch one of the eight games this weekend, it might be this one or at least of the Sweet 16 round. Uh, and these games are so good. When you don't get the upsets, you get a, a payoff in the in the following rounds because all the games are competitive. All the games are good. I don't know that I'm like cut in line to bet either side of this game. To me, it's a toss up game. I guess when in doubt, go with the best player on the court, and that's Shannon. But I do think this will be maybe an interesting game from a live betting perspective because if they have a tight whistle and they're not, they're not allowing prison rules, they're not allowing Iowa State to be physical. That favors Illinois. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. That favors yeah. That favors Illinois where yeah. Iowa State wants to be physical, wants to be aggressive. So sometimes you can get a feel for these games early and how it's being called and, and, and go from there. I think Iowa State wants to be able to you know get, get away with some of that contact where uh, that that would be benefit um, them to to play that way. So officiating is going to be a key, I think, in a lot of these games. We're talking about Purdue-Gonzaga. This is another one where I think the officiating is very important. 
J- Jeff, did you make yeah. it through the uh, the Oregon Creighton game the other uh, night? I, uh, or did, you I did. I mean, I I did. I yeah. I don't remember what happened. I was so tired, and it was uh, tough to remember the very end of that game. Um, I uh, yeah, I, I made it. Unfortunately, I I did. Tur- I mean, I turned off like a minute left in second overtime. I was like, this is probably it. I don't think we're winning this game. <laughs> It's unfortunate. I mean, look, we don't got two guys that can score. That's what happens. Uh, Illinois has more guys that can score, which is good for them. Would Would you guys go back to the the Shannon? Well, it's twenty one and a half right now for his point total. He's been over that number six straight games. Does Iowa State just say, "Hey, man, you're not beating us," or do you take the over? It feels low for his production level the last six games. Twenty one. Uh, it that does. It does seem like a low number. It does seem low. Oh yeah, it'd be over or nothing. I think for me. He gets to the free throw line so much, and he's so explosive and athletic. And that's the other thing. They don't have a true point guard. So oftentimes when you get to that second half and it's a close game, he's bringing the ball up the floor or he takes the handoff at midcourt. So I think the amount of usage that Terrence Shannon tends to occupy, um, it's very tough. And and again, to those two guards, Shannon's 80% at the line. The mask is 90% at the line. So those two guys make their free throws. They just have to stop turning the ball over. But I I would lean over on the point prop. I mean, this is a guy, Bear, who might play himself into the top seven of the draft if he has a really good game against Iowa State. And then, hey, he balls out against UConn. I'm not saying Illinois is going to win, but if he has the ability to raise his draft stock even more uh, against a very good Iowa State team and the best team in the country in UConn. Moving on to... The West uh, first game on Thursday will be on probably around opposite the uh, the UConn San Diego State game. When that one gets out of hand, you can flip on over to Clemson Arizona. Uh, the Cats seven and a half, uh, 152 is the total. I'm a little interested in maybe taking Clemson plus the points here, only because I think stylistically this is the type of game and team that Arizona can have some trouble with the way Clemson defended uh, against Baylor took them out of their offensive rhythm. When, when you, when you make Arizona work, work for a shot, take them out of transition, put them in a half court. And look, we, we, we all I don't think any of us have the, the most utmost faith uh, in trust level in Tommy Lloyd. If Caleb love doesn't have a game like that, there, there are, there are quite a few avenues here I think to this being a very close game. I have not pulled the trigger yet on Clemson plus seven and a half, but I think uh, I think will if I had to play or, or should Jeff, I should say, being yeah. that you are you are a designated uh, West Coast uh, <laughs> R.I.P. Pac-12 expert. Thank uh, you. I would uh, by right now I, I I could be nudged a little bit into taking the Tigers plus the seven and a half. I'm fairly certain Arizona barely covered against Dayton, right? So that's Tommy Lloyd's first cover now in in six tournament games. I think he's one in five against the spread as a coach. Arizona, just for whatever reason, these games stay close. And Clemson has a lot of ways they can score and keep this game where they right they 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 shoot threes well. Arizona doesn't uh, contest catch and shoots very well. Arizona times can stop scoring. We've talked about this now for a couple of years. They just have moments where they don't score for long periods of time. And so, Will, I I would certainly lead Clemson here with their ability to score. I think more ways than Arizona has. Yep, I uh, I lean towards Clemson plus the seven and a half. Uh, eventually, some of these dogs are going to start to cover at some point. Yes. You would think. Please uh, I think, God. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I'm I'm totally with you. And I, I think a lot of what Bear said is true. Where you got to be able to keep Arizona out of transition. You got to uh, do what Oregon did in the Pac-12 tournament. Not to bring up a painful memory, Bear, but uh, yeah, make them good. jump shooters. Make them a three-point team and a three-point shooting team. And say, hey, you know what? If you're going to make this, your threes, we tip our cap and we're we're going to go home. You're going to beat us. But there's, they're a really good offense. When we say we want about Lloyd, if we trust them or not, they're a really good offense. And with a really good offense, you can't take away everything. You just got to make them jump shooters. And I, I think what you like, if you're Clemson, you've won two games in this tournament and you haven't gotten that monster game out of hall. So uh, I think Clemson plus the points is uh, is a good way to go. I mean, you mentioned Lloyd is Oh, five and one or, or one and five now against the spread of the tournament. And even against Dayton, man, that, that final yeah. score, I think it landed on 10 and it was right around the, uh, the closing number, depending on when you got it. Dayton had their opportunities. They missed a couple yeah. of one and ones that led to threes. I mean, there was a good six or seven point swing there with uh, some missed one and ones that led to some threes for Arizona. So, look, uh, it, it's always scary stepping in front of Arizona because their upside is uh, is tremendous. And if they could ever get to a final four, they'll have a home court. But uh, I, I do like Clemson plus seven and a half here. And at the same time, Sammy, as well, what we talked about before playing uh, Iowa Iowa State Illinois live, maybe maybe Arizona. Uh, 
Clemson is a live game, and we saw it with with, with Dayton where Arizona got up. 16 or whatever it was at some point and, and right that was when i hopped in and took clemson live like pl- or a date in live plus like 14 and a half just because you know inevitably arizona is going to have that little bit of a lull and 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 the dog is probably going to work their way back in the game some some so maybe live might be the way to play this game yeah but at the same time if you're a clemson fan and you want to bet clemson and they do what they did in the first two games i mean they were in total control against new mexico and total control against Baylor. So if you're thinking about taking the seven, seven and a half with Clemson and you wait until it gets live and Clemson's up five, you can kiss the seven and a half goodbye. I mean, it works both ways. I think this is a game where Arizona does go down. And here's, to me, the biggest key in the game, the free throw line. Clemson is 79%, boys and girls, at the free throw line. Eighth best team in the country, 79%. Arizona, barely over 70%. Yeah. So if this gets into a close game, I mean, Arizona's got a really good team. Awesome defensively. They can get up. They can push the pace. But in these tight games, they have not one, not two, but three guys on the court at all times that you can foul that shoot like 60 to 70%. And if you don't get the ball in the right person's hands, Arizona's going to lose this game late. So I'm inclined to take the points. And look, we talked about the Big Ten and the Big East and the SEC, look at the ACC. You got North Carolina has rolled two teams. Duke has rolled two teams. Clemson has rolled two teams. Nobody talked about the ACC before this tournament. And now you got a really good ACC team getting seven and a half. It feels like a lot. And the other game, Will, you got a a really good ACC team laying four and a half with the, uh, the monster total of 173 and a half, North Carolina, against Alabama I grabbed uh, here here I here I am again who who needs the best of the number I grabbed Alabama plus the four uh for the column I, I probably should have waited realizing this line was going to go up but I was on Michigan State on Saturday and yeah. looked great early they got out to a big lead but it, it, that game was kind of a microcosm of uh Michigan State season they, they took a lead went into a lull uh Sammy had that. He had the, uh, the great retweeted and talked about it in the group chat the other day about the the, the guy on the, who had a first to thirty Michigan State. They're up twenty eight fifteen, and he wound up <laughs> losing the bet, and which mm. which is brutal. But I, I had the Spartans. It looked good, and then in the second half they worked their way back in it, and then went into another lull. So, like UNC is not going to have that Charlotte home crowd in this game. Um, I worry. Look, I do worry that maybe the lack of defense from you from Alabama could be problematic but that game uh, Sunday against Grand Canyon is Sammy was talking about earlier as well like that that was a different type of game now I look some of the offensive sets that Grand Canyon had really weren't offensive what offensive sets sets bear just (laughs) dribbling just running in the middle of the defense and losing the ball and Alabama (laughs) taking the ball and missing a layup and then just going back and forth for seven minutes straight I've never seen a game like that like I I was my brain was hurting trying to watch a game, and Bama covered in the end, which they should have, because they were better. And, and, oh, and, give me a break they should have covered. They, 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 they should not have covered. They should have covered that. Yes. No, they shouldn't they they covered that covered, game. Jeff. When you, they should have covered. I, and I cashed that ticket. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> Sam. No, no, no. They, see, no, they, 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 this is, this is a, gr- a, gr- a great little, like, there's the, there's the right side, wrong result. And then there's the oh the right side is the winning side. I am on the uh, or, or okay. wrong wrong result right side. This was like wrong result right side. If you had Grand Canyon, you had the right side. You got Alabama the- shot better from two from three. They out rebounded them. They were eight they of less thirty-one turnout. from they, three, they, and they, everybody outside of they were two. Of three Grand Canyon was two of twenty from three. Bear, they they outplayed them in every statistical category. Like the, Grand Canyon missed 25 threes and 8 million free throws, well, they and they were up by three with three minutes to go. They had 17 more foul shots than Bama. That that was crazy, though. The, the foul shot disparity in that game. The, the officiating in this tournament, uh, you always get reminded that sometimes it's a little inconsistent in a lot of these games. They're yeah, just that's guessing. like in the in the in the in the Iowa in the in the Iowa West Virginia game the the other night. Like, what what did people expect? Like, like if you if you didn't think that they were going to try out an officiating crew of, of Hayden Fry, B.J. Armstrong, and former <laughs> WWF referee Danny Davis, like I don't know what planet you are on. You knew <laughs> Iowa was going to get every call on that game. But anyway, Alabama, North Carolina, 
I grab the four with the uh, with the Crimson Tide. Will uh, am I going to hate myself for grabbing the same kind of point total that I did with, with Michigan State on on, on the weekend? I mean, I want to get there with Bama. I do worry they foul too much. I do worry if they don't have, you know, have an answer for Baycott. Um, with Bama, it's going to come down to the threes. I mean, they are look, they, they are lucky to be in this round. I mean, Grand Canyon could make a three or make a free throw that, that was not going to uh, end well for Bama. I, I don't have a play here. I was actually tempted, boy, under 173 and a half, get, maybe get you know, 174. You're playing in Remember. Staples Center to the crypto. It's in L.A. It's a big cavernous NBA arena. Don't you feel like a sweet 16 with everything that's on the line? The pace maybe slows a little bit. I mean, 174, you get a 90 to 80 game. That's a high scoring college that's basketball really game. High. That's still under by a few points. So, again, I mean, you could look up and it's 60 all at halftime. And you're like, what the hell did I bet on? But I don't know. Maybe I might have the guts here to have an under here and, and just plug my nose. And, and again, live betting is a good opportunity with Bama because you get such swings. I, I remember Charleston got up a good seven, eight points early. and You could have got Bama minus two or three. They give up so many points. They score so many points that there are some good opportunities to jump in live and look, try to try to middle the game at some point where, you know, one team goes on a run, you bet against them and vice versa. So uh, lean to the under lean towards taking the points. This is not, not a game. I love either way. Yeah. Carolina plays fast, but Carolina's defense is criminally underrated. I mean, this is a top 15 defense in so many different ways. And look, Michigan state was not a gangbuster team by any means all year, but to hold them to six of 16 from three in the game, that was impressive because that team came out and we bear just brought it up 28, 15. And then for the remainder of that game, they couldn't make a shot. And this is a game, if you want to bet the under, it's probably going to be the sharp side. You know, they're going to let this kind of build up over the next couple of days. They're going to come under 174. If you bet the under, well, you probably don't want to watch it <laughs> because you're going to see that like eight, nine point minute and you're going to want to hide under the bed and it's totally fair. But so many things have to go right to get yes. over 174. Like you get one four or five minute dead patch this yeah. game is going to stay under, barring you avoid overtime. That's the only thing yeah. that's going to kill you. I, I happen to know a couple of guys that are going to let this get to the tip, 174, 174 and a half, and then they're going to come under in this game because that is so many points. And usually you don't get these 95 to 90 games when you get to the Sweet 16, the Elite Eight, the Final Four, because defense actually matters in games like this. You, you, mean, you mean like under 148 and a half in Oregon, Creighton? We're kind of How many times are we going to talk about this game, guys? You should, you continue because it was an awful, every, awful, awful every, beat for every, me. Yeah, and Will, it wasn't under it wasn't for me. I was, and it took two friggin' overtimes I'm, for us to lose. I think I felt I'm laying in bed at, at 12, 25 a.m. trying to watch the end of this game, trying to stay awake as an Oregon fan. Go ahead, Sam. Hold on, Jeff. Okay, so Grand Canyon was the right side. Was Creighton the right side against Oregon? Uh, No. Okay. All right. Wanted to, wanted to clear I, that up. My Grand Canyon point was I look again, I'm a shot better, less turnovers. I and the, the free throw thing was a problem. But here's here's the thing about, about this game I worry about the North Carolina is as of right now, 92% of wagers are North Carolina. Like that's just everyone is betting Carolina. It because was the same way against Michigan of, State. I know, it, it, but it's because of we saw Alabama play so poorly against Grand Canyon. We saw Mich uh, excuse me, We saw North Carolina play so well, and at some point, we keep mentioning this. I know Sammy's waiting for this. The public is going to get axed, right? There's going to be a moment of this tournament where that's going to happen, and this feels like the game where, and I think Bears correct being on Alabama here, where it could certainly happen because again, you're looking at last results. Michigan State, I mean, excuse me, North Carolina blew it. Michigan State, Bama struggled to cover against against Grand Canyon, and now they both meet in this game. Can you know, I read a quick parlay from my cousin who never wins? I'd like to share this with the group chat. If <laughs> yes, I may. This, is, this is on Saturday. It was a $15 parlay. $15, right? Arizona minus the points. Gonzaga minus the points. North Carolina minus the points. Iowa State minus the points. NC State money line. Tennessee money line. Illinois minus the points. Creighton minus the points. Winner. And he sends me a text after the Creighton game with the parlay screenshot. It was 15 to win like $400. And he goes, man, this is easy. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm going to die on the spot. This is how I die right here. I, co I, I couldn't believe it. 
just favorite, 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 favorite. <laughs> Who's the only favorite that lost? Was it Baylor? Yes. In the Sweet 16? The, the loss, only yeah. favorite that lost outright was Baylor. That never happens. 15 and 1 money line favorites. It, it, it's been and someone, um, a buddy of mine from uh, from Odds Jam get, texted me the other day too, say, saying that I guess there was a Bet Labs tweet or a note out there like sides that it received like more than 65% of the, the tickets or something like that are hitting at like 75%. So yeah. it's, been, it's been a massive public tournament and we'll see if it turns around. And, and we, I mentioned North Carolina was a huge public side of Michigan State. North Carolina State continues to be a massive public side. The, the ACC champion, the 11 seed Wolfpack, six and a half point dog against the Marquette. And this is a, this is the game that I want no part of. Uh, will because I could see a scenario where NC State finally runs up against it, but at the same time, Marquette's not deep. Uh, do you want, I mean, really kind of fortunate to get out of that Colorado game with the win. Like, like I think of all those ones and twos, I, I think Marquette potentially could be in the most trouble this weekend. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting game. First off, shout out to the kid on Colorado. The, the line's four and a half. It's a four point game with seven seconds left, and he takes his sweet time dribbling and waits till the buzzer to shoot, making sure hey, if it missed, there's no foul. And that was a very <laughs> strange last seven seconds uh, for anybody watching with, with any involvement in the spread. I actually like the over this game. I think with with Burns and four shooters around him, that's a very hard offense to stop. He's such a good passer. He's he's got such a nice touch. He's so you know nimble on his feet for his size. He's really just uh, an incredible athlete. Um, but I I don't know if if they have any answers to stop Marquette. I think with Kolek, they can put Burns in a pick and roll, make him play in space, and really they're going to have some open looks. So what are we at? One fifty one, one fifty two, yeah. right around that range. Yeah. I I think this could be an over. I I think the winner could uh could maybe be in the eighties in this game. So uh, I like the over here. I would lean towards taking the points. I think maybe NC State has enough offense to hang in here. And I'm I'm kind of in my own head here where I'm like, all right, eventually the dogs have to bark at some point. Uh, and that's a, a dangerous game to play. Hey, this is due or that's due. Nothing's due. These are isolated events. They're not in, related to each other. So that's not yeah. a good way to look at it. But uh, I, I'm going to go with the over here. You, you're, you're, you're right with the, with the I think, the idea of maybe playing the over because the spread suggesting six and a half. Or so so you're, you're looking at that foul zone late yes. potentially if Marquette is winning. So uh, you, you can probably tack on probably another. 10, 11 points maybe in, in that game just between free throws and then maybe a couple of three-pointers. So I wonder if these teams, too, with these totals, if they'll start to foul more because we've been talking about this off the air a lot this year where, hey, these teams just don't foul as much. With a minute to go, six-point game, they just let it play out and they just kind of walk off the court. But with Texas A&M coming back and almost beating Houston down 12 with under two minutes to go, you wonder if teams around college see that and say, hey, it's possible and these, these games can drag out a little bit with the, the point totals and the fouls. Yeah, Marquette's not the greatest free throw shooting team either. So maybe there's a strategy there for Kevin Keats and the Wolfpack. And when you look at their numbers, 70% at the free throw line for Marquette, that's 245th in the country. Um, Bears right though. I mean, this line says that it's a step up in competition. And I think we all know that without having to even say it. It's the elephant in the room. Marquette is much better than Oakland, even though Oakland ruined my life last Thursday, which <laughs> thank you guys for not bringing it up yet. <laughs> I do. I'm over it. I'm clearly over it. I'm not. Um, <laughs> I never wanted to cry more at a basketball game than when Oakland beat Kentucky. Uh, Marquette probably gets a big lead in this game, but I, I think the point about the over is very good I, because you're going to get an extended game. Like we might see, like, and let's look at the second half total too when it comes out. Like that might be not a blind bet, but let's say we get a nice pace here in the first half and it's like, 40 to 32 Marquette, I will immediately look at that second half total and think, all right, we're going to get some points here and we're going to get fouls. You just need NC State. The only problem is with that, Will, is that you need it to stay inside 10. If right. it gets to, you know, if it gets to 25, we're not going to get there in the second half because nobody's going to foul. But I do think that overlook is good and the market agrees with you. Open 150, we're seeing 151 and a half offshore. It's still two days away from tip. We taped this on a Wednesday, so we're probably going to see a little bit more over money. Um, I do think we get points in that second half, though, so I'll be looking at that one once we get to the half. Uh, where's that game at? In Dallas. I'll go second half over likely 
uh, assuming it's not a blowout at that point in time. I yeah, I like some of the NC State big guys over their rebound numbers in this game, including Burns. He doesn't get a lot of rebounds, only four and a half, but Marquette is a very awful rebounding team. We saw Colorado take advantage of this. I think that if you look for, for some way to play this game, those props, those over-rebound props for the leading rebounders of, 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 of NC State is a way to play this for me. I, I'm going to have Burns later uh, in, in best bets. I just watched Marquette. Again, if you look at all the big men they play, the big men they play go over their, their props almost every game, points, rebounds, because they're very poor, uh, both offensive, defensive, rebounds. It's a, it's a big part of could be their downfall in this game is not being able to get any rebounds. Could he play in the NFL, Jeff, that burns? Could Absolutely, he yes. Yeah, you think he should so? just, Interesting. Yes, he should just, he should, after this tournament, just go over the football field, get himself a pair of pads, get ready for the draft. I, I like the Eagles, obviously, very famously got Mulata, the rugby player. Like, I, I someone would be like, hey, man, I'll, I'll, I'll track you in the seventh round. I've, I, I, I know you can move. I've seen you move a little bit. What position, seven, line or tight end? No, offensive line. Okay. Yeah, no, he's one of us. Sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, buddy. You're one. You're 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 one of us. Um, but uh, I, I like those prop numbers in in this game because I think that again, Marquette's like two seventy three, two seventy four in uh in rebound efficiency. I'm surprised he hasn't been scooped up by Rays and Canes or somebody. Yeah, I mean that's just like the perfect yeah. marriage yeah. between the big guy and you can just get a, a fast food restaurant. Maybe Arby's comes back to the table. Axby's. Yeah, whatever. Just get in there. He he has a deal with like vending machines or something. He has like some sort of fun well, and deal though. He of doesn't have he a does. yeah. He doesn't have like a raising canes one yet. He should get something to for for food. You know, he owns two vending machines. That's what it is. I'm not even sure it's nil. He just I think he just owns two he vending. Built like very, a vending machine. Yeah yeah. It's a very interesting uh a very interesting uh you know thing he's got going on. That's a that that's a good. The, I always said the one thing I would love to own is like one of those ATMs, like in a, in a like either an adult entertainment establishment, or or like a, <laughs> near a, near like a, a race book or something. Like like if you own those ATMs and like you, you, people are gonna pay like twelve percent vig on like getting money out of it, like that that is an absolute like business boom. So do it, Bear. Just you a, should have negotiated into your contract. Yeah. I think you're a little late on that one. Yeah. I can't wait till Bear Bats goes to Atlanta to an adult establishment <laughs> next year for football. It's going to be awesome. Uh, well, well, Bear Bats is going to go to Dallas for the uh, for the second game here between Houston and Duke, and it obviously should be a pretty significant uh, home court advantage for Houston here. And, and I like Houston in this game. I, I think everyone is focusing so much on what happened in the final minute, minute and 50, whatever that game. Like it was a, it was impossible that that game got to overtime. It was, it's 74, 61, it's a 99% win probability before all the ridiculousness happened. Like A&M struggled all night from shooting. Prior and, and Shed and Sharp made huge plays all night long. I don't think McCain is gonna have nearly uh, as easy of a time finding Finding looks like he did against JMU. I think the interior will will not be easy for uh, for Filipowski. I, I know it's been a while since Duke beat a higher seed. Uh, they typically don't get too many opportunities to do that, but look, I, I think Houston is really good, and I, I think the fact that pe I think people are overlooking what they did to the point of getting up 74-61 to like the the completely random, nearly impossible chain. Like they had four guys foul out, and they still came back. <laughs> and managed to bow up in overtime and tough that out and win the game, man. So uh, I like this Houston team, and, and I like a minus four. There's a interesting scenario here, Bear, thinking about what you can do with Houston in the Final Four market just to make the Final Four. And I pulled up the uh, all the different prices on I'm Houston to reach said Final Four. As low as even money, as high as three to two, so plus 150. Then you look at the money line in this game, and Houston's minus 190, almost minus $2. There's a world where you can take Houston. I know we sort of missed the boat. You, you obviously want to bet this before the tournament starts, yeah. but talk me out of a Houston to make the Final Four bet at plus 150. And then if, say, NC State upsets Marquette, that ticket is basically a cash. Yeah, and then, then you can come back and you can take NC State plus eight well, and a half or nine on a middle. Well, you can just roll that ticket because if Houston's going to play Marquette, you're looking at at least 
$253 on the money line. And if it's NC State, it's even higher. It's minus 400. So even though it's sort of beyond the point of like getting great value, Houston's probably going to win this game and they're probably going to win the next game. So at plus 150, when, when other books are offering you even money plus 110, I don't think that's the worst idea in the world. It's not, I like that idea. I might, I might, I might have to drive to Massachusetts when we're done recording this to be able to bet, to bet the, uh, the, the, the region and, and, and the winner. That's crazy. Well, think about the price. I mean, what's the money line price Houston Marquette? It's got to be minus, it's got to be minus 260, minus 270. Probably. And then you yeah. could you can middle it, and if Houston beats Marquette by three, you win you win everything. Houston, Will, NC want to go State take a upset. Ride with me? Yeah, that's that's not a, a bad idea, but I'm just getting flashbacks. Houston, NC State, an upset there would uh would would trigger some memories. No, I'm with you. I like Duke here. I I just think they're too physical, too tough for Duke. Duke could be a little soft, a little small. It's interesting that everyone's always like, hey, Duke gets every call. Now you're gonna put. Uh, them in a situation where they're in Texas against Houston, where the, the refs are so important for Houston because they're so physical. They're almost like a football team where they're so aggressive. They're so handsy. You can call a foul or not call a foul, basically any play. And look, I don't care what anyone says. When you're, when you have a home court advantage or a uh, semi home court advantage, that helps sway the officials in, in some way. So that's an interesting pull and push here with the refs who gets the calls. But uh, I just think Houston's too tough and look, give them credit. Anyone that believes in momentum, you just, you show them Texas A&M and Houston, the the other night because if momentum had anything to do with it AM wins that game and wins it going away so houston at least showed some mental toughness why they weren't guarding the three-point line any better with one second left i have no idea why you're Samson's guarding the way so samson's one of those guys very man, strange he foul up three even if you're not going to foul just have all five of your guys spread out around the perimeter you don't need guys under the hoop that was a very strange alignment but uh, i'm with you here i like houston I'm I'm with you guys and with you. So I think they have more ways to win. And the physical part of this is 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 a big thing for me. The only concern I have, again, I think at times we we've seen this as long as Iowa State, like the spookiness of their offense. If they just go dead for seven to eight minutes for whatever reason, uh, is that enough to to still beat Duke in this situation? I'm not quite sure, but they haven't really shown that much out of that one game this year. They've had some lower scoring losses, but you know, that happens in college basketball over 30 games. It's just the question is if they have again a seven, eight minute stretch in this game where they don't score very much, is that enough to basically make them lose the game? That's the only question. I think ultimately it will come down to how well Duke makes shots. If they do make shots, if they continue to make shots like they did uh, against JMU. So that we, we all kind of, I think are on, Houston here, and I think maybe Sammy Sammy's way of playing this is probably the uh, the best way of doing it because if Houston does beat Duke, that certainly will be a uh, significantly more than uh, plus one hundred five, minus one, whatever whatever Houston is to to win that region now. So see, I, I, I see you're 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 you're, 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 just you're, you're, you're 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 alive again now. You're you're over the Kentucky loss. It's it's clear your your mind is functioning again. So uh, uh, we we all know it was tough. <laughs> I know it was tough, but we're glad that you're back here. So final region, Midwest, uh, Purdue, Gonzaga uh, is the, uh, I believe, the first game on uh, on Friday night. Am I, am I correct in that? In, in, the, in that uh, I am. Uh, Purdue, five and a half, 154 and a half. Uh, what Gonzaga did to, to Kansas the other day was just a complete dissection from late in the first half to the first 10 minutes of the second half just did whatever they wanted. And I, I can see, uh, I can see Gonzaga being a little bit of a, uh, a public dog here with how good they've been. Uh, what ninth straight sweet 16 now for Mark Fuse program, which is a, an incredible accomplishment. Mark, Matt Painter's struggles in the sweet 16 have been well documented. Uh, I, I can, I can see, uh, I can see a lot of people here on Gonzaga. Well, can you? It's interesting because we talk about, hey, are, are they due? It is that whole fallacy thing. But the one thing that's real, I, I think the books are going to adjust these lines for the favorites. They just say, hey, you know what? If you're going to keep beating us on the favorites, we're going to make you pay a tax and everything's going to be bumped by a, a point, a half a point. So I don't know. Are, are there going to be public dogs this week? I know NC State's taking some money. So uh, you might be right. Nine, nine straight sweet 16s. We know this team. Uh, I would lean towards Gonzaga here. Now, I know. You have some concerns because they're not a deep team. They're a very thin team. They don't have a lot of depth. And if you get in foul trouble against Edie, which you can do, that spells trouble. But I like the fact that they've seen Edie. They played last year and they played this year. So this is going to yeah. be the third time since last Thanksgiving they've seen Edie. And he's such a unique guy to prep for where 
if you haven't seen him, there's a little bit of a shock right away where, all right, I, I don't know what to do with this guy. They at least have seen him. They have EK, they have Huff. They've got some size to throw at him. So again, this is going to be a, a situation where the officiating is so important. Um, ultimately, like Gonzaga was up by five in, in the meeting earlier in the year. And they end up losing. Purdue won the game. They won it comfortably. But Gonzaga shot six of 32 from three. Gonzaga is shooting the ball much better recently. They have shot the ball incredibly well the last you know month, six weeks. So it would be a lean to Gonzaga. Uh, I am a little nervous about pulling the trigger just because, hey, if Edie gets your whole team in foul trouble, this is going to get away from you. So, again, maybe another live betting opportunity. But uh, it, it would be a lean towards Gonzaga for me. Well, finally, we get some size against Purdue. That's going to be nice to watch Zach Eady play against guys that are, you know, 6'7 or 6'8. That'd be really <laughs> nice. Like Grambling State. He's like playing against third graders. And then Utah State, like, Utah State had no idea what to do against Edie. They were just like, let's just whack him. And it, like, Gonzaga at least has the size. I mean, EK 6'9, Huff 6'10, Watson 6'8. You know, ben Gregg is more of a wing guy, but he's 6'10. They they at least have the size to negate entry passes and at least challenge shots. And I look, I, I think Purdue, I'm rooting for Purdue because to see them lose last year to a 16, it was funny, but it was also sad. Like I would love to see them go to the final four. That said, Watching them is just not fun. It's not a fun watch. No. Can anybody like back me up? It's not fun it's not, watching not Purdue fun. trudge up and down the court and just shoot free throws for 12 minutes. Like to me, I don't want to watch that crap. Yeah. So I'm pulling for Gonzaga by default. Um, but you, you look at the size and the wingspans that Gonzaga can bring to the table. It's unlike anything Purdue has seen in two games against Grambling State and Utah State. And that's a fact. I like the over in this game. Um, both teams can score. The the over hits in a lot of Mark Few tournament games. I just want to say that the, my least favorite talking point is around this game of, of really any college sports, which is basically you have to win a championship to get validation, right? There's a lot of teams in college football and in, in college basketball that really aren't championship teams. They're just not going to win. They don't have enough talent. They're, they're, they don't recruit well enough. They're in a bad part of the country for that. But Gonzaga's been in the tournament, excuse me, this week you've seen nine times in a row. Do you know how many programs would love to make the Sweet 16 nine times in a row? And what Mark Few has done with them getting better this season, but just continuing success year after year in Spokane, Washington, is incredible. We should not downplay what they've done because they have not won a title. They're not going to win this year, I don't think, but we should celebrate what Gonzaga has done with Mark Few being there. I, I hate this talking point of that, that they have to win a championship to validate how good they've been over the last nine years. I would agree with you. They, they, they did reach the Final Four. They came very close to <clears throat> to winning a national championship again, a game against uh, North Carolina. So I, I'm with him. And there shouldn't be any question about what Mark Few has done uh, in Spokane. And I think there is a, a, a pretty good, uh, sizable chunk of the country that, that is rooting for them on, uh, on Friday night. And then last game on Friday, Tennessee, Creighton, the Vols, two and a half, 143 and a half. I'm curious to see what type, if there are some type of combined three-point shots Ooh. made over uh, prop in this game, because I would expect both Creighton and Tennessee to improve on the shooting that nights that they had this this past weekend. I mean, that, that's the only I'm that's like the only thing I'd be looking at maybe in, in this game to play because. I just don't know. Like Creighton's a team I really haven't been able to kind of be on the right side of all year. Uh, I've been on the wrong side more often than the right. In Tennessee, like, maybe like there's another. I mean, we talked about Purdue's failures in the tournament. This is a Tennessee team. I wonder if, and we brought this up earlier with uh with with John Fanta. I'm curious to get your take on this, Sammy P and Will. Like the fact that. You had so many you know, those those types of games where you came up on the losing side. You had a big lead and you, you nearly blew it. You couldn't hit a shot from the outside, and and, and you survived. I just wonder if uh, Rick Barnes and his team and his program can like finally like exhale now and be like, wow, okay, we we won one of those games. Now it, it can happen. We're not completely cursed. So I wonder if the Vols maybe play a little bit freer and looser. On, uh, on on Friday night, despite there's such huge stakes in the game, Will. 
Yeah, interesting game. And boy, you, you think Tennessee will improve on that three of 25 from three? Imagine shooting yeah. 12% from a three. Like, is that a good sign that they shot three of 25 and still won? Or is that concerning? I, I don't know that Creighton has a good answer for connect. And, and that's why it ultimately would lean towards Tennessee. Although I'm not, I'm not crazy about laying two and a half, three here with uh with Rick Barnes. Uh, it's interesting. I, I was I was going to make the same point about Creighton. Hey, they're going to shoot a little better from three. They had a bad night. And I went and like kind of fact, fact check myself. They got up to 39% from three. Now, some of that was late in, in overtime. I think they got red hot, but boy, 39% is not that bad, but watching the game, it felt like it was just brick mm -hmm. after brick um, and, and not to bring up painful memories with Jeff here, but I don't know. Interesting game. Great game. This is, this again, falls under the umbrella, man. This is a hell of a game to watch. I don't know that you look at this in terms of the side in total and, and find some massive edge, Sammy. Um, it would be a lean towards Tennessee, but some of these games that are great to great to watch, but from a betting perspective, I, I just don't see a lot where boy, this line's in off. Uh, this line's off. I have to bet this game. I don't think I'll have a single dollar on it. We've seen the market move up on the total, 142 and a half to as high as 144, which plays into your point there about probably more shots being made. Um, this is my last flag in the ground, Creighton 40 to one to win the whole thing. So please just win this game and then I can maybe do what I have to do. That would be nice. And it would only be fitting guys if the great white hope from Northern Colorado was the guy that finally got Rick Barnes to where he needed to go. Wouldn't that just be a great story for college <laughs> basketball? Like you need this kid that nobody knew who he was a year ago. We need him to get Tennessee to the final four, but he's a bucket, man. He's a walking bucket that Dalton connect. And uh, that's going to be, I think that's my favorite game on the board. The Friday 10, 10 Creighton, Tennessee tip. That's going to be an awesome game. Are you staying awake for that, Sammy? Are you going to make be it? Up. It'll, be be a, up. it'll tip about 10 30. I, uh, kind of the theme that you guys have been going, I like Crane over 32 and a half points in the first half. I just think we see in a tournament when a team shoots poorly, that shoots well most of the time. The next game, I know this game is obviously days removed from the last game they played, but they tend to just have a better first half um, or, or full game. So that's the way I look to play this game, uh, at least early on. It's just taking Crane to shoot the ball much better early in this game. Uh, Will's point is accurate. They were 39%, but Will, I it felt like they were 25% in yep. regulation. I think, I think the second half is when uh, they made a, a bunch of their threes. And so I would lean toward Crane scoring a bunch of points early in this game. So who do we do? It's just, I guess, right in rap, we, we still think this is UConn's to lose, right? Yes, I do. Sammy? Yes. Yeah, boring. <laughs> Outside of Creighton. <laughs> Who's the most Is that fun? Be UConn? Who's the most fun champion? Who's the most the fun most to win this? Fun, tournament? the most fun champion, yeah. most fun NC realistic State. champion. Yeah, yes. NC State, but that's not. I don't think that's. Oh realistic. yeah, they're not going to win the championship. Most fun would be. I would say Kentucky still. Sorry, Sam. No, getting them no the, the teams that are left. The teams that are left will. Okay, like, you didn't who, specify. Who, who'd be the most fun to win to win this championship? But the teams I that guess are left, maybe Arizona, just because the Pac-12 is going away and oh, everyone's bad mouth awesome. avoid. You know, yeah, I don't, I don't know. There, I'd agree with that. Nobody outside the, you know, we've had that stat. Nobody in the West Coast has won in a while, so maybe maybe Arizona. What about Gonzaga, Mark Gonzaga Gonzaga would be the one. one. That's a good answer. Gonzaga. That might be a better answer. That's a good one. Gonzaga would be the team I'd choose. Yeah, Kentucky's the real answer, though. To be fair. <laughs> <laughs> We were, we were hey, put, we, we just, we're just gonna put him in the final four anyway. They, they go Sammy. back into the tournament. Yeah, they just show up at the building and say, "Who do we play? And what times?" What's up? But, but Calipari develops good pros, and that's what you should be excited about. Kentucky. So he develops the good pros. Doesn't matter if they win or lose in his actual job, but he gets guys to, to, to you know to the NBA. You should celebrate that, buddy. You should wager on that somehow. How do you not know that the only thing that Golki <laughs> guy does is shoot threes? How do you not know that? Clearly, uh, they did. Let and it go, Sammy. Unfortunately, let it all out. Unfortunately, we have to let it go. We we hope that we have a, a bunch of correct answers within those eight games right there. Hopefully, the uh, Sweet 16 will be better than what the uh, first second round drew. Guys, appreciate you. Talk soon. All right. Another wonderful gamma group chat there, Bear. It's time for our best bets for a weekend of ball. Now, these bets obviously are just for Thursday and Friday. Saturday and Sunday, the games are not they're not out yet, right? There's no lines yet. There's no opponents yet, Bear. So give us your best bet for Thursday or Friday. Yeah, I talked about it in the gamma group chat with the guys. That I like Iowa State on the money line to beat yeah. Illinois. Uh, I, I know Illinois has been a, an offensive juggernaut so far, but I think going against an Iowa State team, that defensively has shut a lot of teams down this course of the season. 
Uh, I, I think it's an Iowa State team that's been still a little undervalued. Like I said, I was worried about them maybe being a little bit too trendy of a pick so far in the tournament. And those teams, uh, the history is usually not very, very kind, but they they look great in the first two rounds. Yeah. I, I think they do enough against those really good Illinois guards. And we'll see lack of a point guard if that maybe hurts uh, you know, and I against a, a good defense if, uh, if Iowa State chooses to apply a little bit more pressure. So uh, give me Iowa State on the money line against Illinois. I, I like their win against Washington State the other day. You know, Iowa State shot so well against, uh, against South Dakota State in that first game, came back, started a little slow against the Cougars, or sort of a grinded out team. The Cougars beat Arizona there, remember, twice this yeah. season, right? Like, And they just sort of grinded them down and down and down. I think the question obviously is, can they grind down the Illinois point guards? I tend to agree with you on this one. Uh, my my best bet is taking the offensive linemen of the schools <laughs> that are left and DJ Burns over 20 and a half points and rebounds for the NC State big man. He, he can score. He averages about 13 points a game, five rebounds, four, four or five rebounds. But more importantly, guys, Marquette does not defend in the post and they do not rebound very well. Go look back. Colorado Lankin hit his, his points and rebounds over. Go back and look at the big men they have played. They give up a ton of rebounds and a ton of points inside. The offense tend to flow through burns out to other players. So give me this wager. The only concern I have, Bear, is he only plays about half a game. So Why is that? It, it's got to have – he's a big buddy, Burns. I know, you're, I know basketball is going well for your buddy. I'm telling you. Put a helmet on. Put some shoulder pads on. Go play left tackle, man. Got a future. You got you, you, It's a lot of money playing left tackle in the National Football League. So and how many vending um, machines on this bet? I he has. I think he has. Two, I think he owns two vending machines. It's, it's a good. It's a. It's a fun. And he just did a partnership with uh, with another podcast to sell some merch. So uh, things are going well. This is by the way. This is the point of NIL, right? Is what happened with Burns having the the uh, the the kid from Oakland that filmed a was it a, a tax commercial in in the hallway. <laughs> of his hotel, like this is the the point of NIL, right? Is the players yep. can cash in on their on their name and likeness in the moment, in the actual moment. Yep. Um, there's also an offer for Caitlin Clark to go play in, in the Big Three for five million dollars. This is great for all these athletes to get these endorsements and and and, and get the money they can. It is, and this is the spirit of it, not yes, what's going on and you're dropping a bag of money and trying to come transfer to my school. So that's a different, that's a different podcast for a different time and a <laughs> yes. different day and a different point in the season. Um, we'll go, we'll get to that, I'm sure, at some point. But uh, good, good, good chat with, uh, yeah. with the guys today. Uh, make sure you check us out tomorrow as well. We'll have another podcast drop with Ben Ben Berlander from the Putman Bats podcast. We'll go over our favorite uh, baseball. Uh, bet storylines a little preview of the season um maybe next week we'll be back with another little final four uh preview with uh with will and sammy and the, and the guys but uh that's it for now for uh always appreciate you guys checking us out and rating reviewing and subscribing wherever you get your uh your podcast appreciate you watching us on the youtube channel as well uh for sammy p for will for jeff i'm bear bless you bet the more you lose when you win.